Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us to our virtual town hall uh, for the Alpena Combat Readiness Training Center PFAS site. Um, I'm going to start with a, just a couple housekeeping slides here. Uh, Christian. Should be sharing. Yep, ready to go if you want to go to the next slide. Okay. So we'll start off. All lines are muted for the webinar, um, and we are recording. So you can go to the next one. And we are throughout the, the uh, evening here, we'll be monitoring the, the question and answer box here on Zoom. So feel free to type in your questions um, and we will uh, hopefully have time to get around to them at the end here. Uh, if you want to raise your hand and, and during the question and answer portion, portion we can uh, have you unmuted um, as well. If you're on the phone um, hitting pound two, we'll raise your hand um, and then we can, we'll circle up and, and show you how to unmute when we get to that point. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Abby Hendershot, who's the executive director for MPART. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate everyone coming out tonight and joining us. Um, as Mike said, I am Abigail Hendershot. I'm the executive director for the Michigan PFAS Action Response Team. Happy to be with you tonight. Uh, tonight, we're going to talk about the Alpena Combat Readiness Training Center, uh, the town hall. And so it looks like we've got um, good participation so far tonight. So happy to see everybody join us for uh, this important update. All right, let's go through introductions, logistics, and agenda. We've got a lot of information to share with you. Um, as Mike said, this is going to be recorded, so don't worry about trying to jot it all down. Um, it'll be put out on the uh, YouTube channel and on our uh, MPART website. Additionally, um, questions and answer boxes at the bottom. So as we go through, if you have questions, feel free to type them in and we can take them at the end, but you don't have to try to remember them as you go through. So you can keep adding questions as we go through. Um, I'm gonna go through the MPART overview, um, quick overview of MPART and PFAS. Um, Seisha Kalakuri is our toxicologist. She's gonna to go through PFAS and public health, uh, answer some of your basic questions on that. Christian Bond is our project manager with the Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy. He's going to be um, walking through all of the things we know about the site investigation so far, answering any questions you have there. Um, Seisha is going to come back and talk about some of the water well resampling um, that's been going on in the Alpena area. And then um, Colonel James Rossi and uh, Mr. Jim King are gonna talk about an Air National Guard update for some of their work that they've been doing as well. And like I said, we will have time for questions and answers at the end. So um, don't feel like you have to uh, keep everything in your head. You can go ahead and type those into the Q&A box. So next slide for us, thank you. So MPART started in 2017 as an executive order, but then has actually, uh, or as executive directive under Governor Snyder, but it's actually uh, remained as an enduring body under executive order 2019-03 with Governor Whitmer. Very excited about that because it really helps us um, take seven different agencies to all create this Michigan PFAS action response team and have, a, have this very unique multi-agency approach to PFAS helps us coordinate um, and lead to strategic implementation of the state's efforts for PFAS, which has really made us uh, a leader for PFAS in the, in the, not only in the state, but in the country as far as the amount of work that uh, Michigan has been able to do around PFAS. Let's go to the next slide. So what are PFAS? And I, I try to say that with a long A, PFAS, um, are per and polyfluoral alkyl substances, uh, which refers to the family of compounds. There's, uh, there's a family of strong carbon fluorine bonds. Usually they're used as surfactants, but they're very, very highly stable. They repel oils and waters and fats and greases. Um, started being manufactured in the 1940s. Today we have 5,000, I've heard up to where 9,000 different compounds, depending on who you talk to. Uh, and so why, what are we really concerned about? Well, we're worried because this stuff gets into the ecosystem. It doesn't naturally biodegrade very easily. Um, and it can bioaccumulate in fish and in, in our bodies and uh, other uh, animals. And so we know that there's some health effects associated with some of the PFAS, but there's a lot of information we don't know. 
and there's a lot, a lot of it, science and research going on, but a lot more needs to be studied. So we're still at the point of lacking any federal standards, which makes Michigan's approach and um, some, of the, some of the standards that we've created so much more important. Next slide. So PFAS uses, as you can see from this slide, it's in a lot of different things. Um, your stain resistance for your carpet, your carpet cleaning products, some of our food packaging has uh, a wide variety of different types of PFAS compounds, your um, scotch guard uh, stain proofing on your furniture, furniture, cosmetics they're showing have some PFAS in them, your outdoor gear, anything that's gonna be waterproofed or weather resistant, including your clothing. The adhesives and sealants are something that um, helps, you know, uh, PFAS would help it, you know, be smoothed out and apply it in a more uniform fashion. It helps that sealant. Protective coatings, we all know about our Teflon pans, um, but our car seats, you know, would be probably coated in some sort of scotch guard. And then the big one, that has brought us here today is the firefighting foam. Now, not all firefighting foam is, has PFAS in it, but um, the firefighting foam that they would use for uh, big um, hydrocarbon fires uh, would be what they call a class B foam. And so that usually has the PFAS in it. Let's go to the next slide. So this slide, kind of shows you the connectedness of PFAS once it gets into our ecosystem. And so we, we kind of call this the PFAS cycle, right? Because we have a lot of industries that may use PFAS um, on the left-hand side, the industries may use PFAS for a variety of different consumer products, but their discharges to the wastewater treatment plant, um, their discharges to the air, their discharges to ground or to surface water may have PFAS in it. And um, wastewater treatment plants are not designed to effectively remove PFAS. So it may continue through the wastewater treatment plant into our biosolids. It may end up as a direct discharge to our streams again, and it may end up in our landfills. And so there's a, a wide variety of different ways this stuff travels and circulates through the ecosystem. And so the job of MPART is to look at all these different pathways try to figure out as many different places that we can stop those cycles. So we can stop PFAS from circulating through um, not even not just our ecosystems, but our fish and our bodies and our air and so on. So it's really an, an important thing because ultimately um, all of our, our jobs are revolving around protection of public health. And the ultimate resource that we have in the state obviously is drinking water. We have over 25% of our state that uses drinking water that they get from the groundwater um, for their, their only source of drinking water. Let's go to the next slide. So one of the other um, things that we do uh, heavily is do a lot of lakes and streams investigations, collecting of water and fish samples, um, sometimes some foam samples, uh, and we've collected a lot of data over the last couple of years about our lakes and streams. Let's go to the next slide. Additionally, there we go. Additionally, um, we have been investigating all of uh, those sites that have groundwater contamination above a groundwater cleanup criteria. And so right now we have identified 193 different locations in the state. A lot of them had used a triple F like the um, like the Air National Guard and some of our other military bases, um, because that's you know that's what was required, and so it was. Um, you know, we've got some widespread contamination, but that doesn't mean necessarily that Michigan is more contaminated than the rest of the country. It's just Michigan has been leading the country in actually evaluating and um, uh, and and identifying those occurrences of PFAS in the state. So I think the other states and parts of the world will look like this when they get around to actually identifying PFAS in their states and their environments. So we've really tried to prioritize those investigations based on the knowns or suspected sources of um, PFAS, as well as the potential for public health um, impacts. And so we focused on those, those sites first. Next slide. Uh, final piece of M part that I really wanna focus on is just to give a shout out to our citizen advisory work group. 
Um, these are residents from impacted PFAS communities around the state, um, and they really come together once a month uh, to sit on a uh, statewide citizens advisory work group to talk about how we can better engage and empower communities around PFAS, how to educate uh, the general public, and just how to make sure we're engaging and listening to their voices. So if you're at all in interested in that, I will have a point at the end of the um, slide presentation, we can talk about where you can find it on our MPAR website. Next slide. All right, now I'm gonna uh, pass it over to Seisha Calicuri, our toxicologist with the Department of Health and Human Services. Seisha. Thanks, Abby, and good evening all. I'm Seisha Calicuri, toxicologist with the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, the next slide. So you just learned earlier through Abby's presentation, you know, regarding PFAS users and the different source areas in general. So I'll go straight into the several ways uh, people could come in contact with PFAS. And this is important to understand so you can prevent exposure. Um, as most of you may already know, food and water are known to be major sources of PFAS exposure. So we are most concerned about exposure via consumption, such as drinking contaminated water or eating contaminated fish. And for fish, we do issue guidelines based on amounts of chemicals found in um, fish. And I'll be talking about it a bit more in detail later during my talk. Um, besides that, we also see incidental swallowing of contaminated soil or dust. That's especially a concern in infants and children because of their hand to mouth tendencies. And some of the other ways you could be exposed are via eating food out of PFAS containing packages, or even using some of the consumer products that may have PFAS in it. Um, and as far as skin contact is concerned, it is not one of the major ways people are exposed to these chemicals. And that's relatively speaking, you know, based on scientific evidence we have till date. So it is okay to do dishes, um, shower or bathe in water that has some PFAS in it, and it is believed not to increase exposure. Next. So this slide here shows a graph with um, blood PFAS levels in the general US population and how those levels decreased over time, uh, starting from the 2000s, which was when the manufacturing of um, especially PFO and PFOS was discontinued. So these measurable levels in blood tell, you know, how persistent and how widely PFAS have been used in commerce. And to sum up, According to the CDC survey, uh, PFAS were found in blood of nearly 98% of the people tested, which is virtually every US resident. Next slide. So based on the many studies, um, you know, adverse health effects have been established for exposure to some of the PFAS chemicals in both human studies and experimental animal models. So associated with higher levels of P4 or P4 exposure is increased risk of health effects such as reduced fertility, high blood pressure or preeclampsia in pregnant women, high cholesterol, especially total and LDL cholesterol, and small decreases in infant birth weight. Next slide. Then there's also increased risk of thyroid disease, liver damage, decreased immune system response to vaccines, and even developing certain types of cancer, um, especially kidney and testicular that's associated with P4 exposure. And one other important thing is these effects are supported by studies of different human populations that are exposed to a few or to many PFAS, including those from populations of high PFAS exposure. And more participants in these studies who had high PFAS exposure had adverse health effects than those with lower levels of PFAS exposure. Um, so note that not all participants with high exposure had adverse health outcomes. Next slide. With that, I'll hand it off to Christiane Bond, geologist with Eagle. Thank you, Seisha. Um, next, I'll talk about the Eagle investigation update. Again, my uh, contact information is listed there. So if you have any questions that come up later um, or we don't get to your question today, feel free to call or email me. Um, so what is Eagle's investigation role? Um, we want to identify and understand risk to drinking water and surface water uh, around Alpena CRTC um, while Air National Guard um, does their on-base investigation and extends off-site eventually. Um, so we did an initial round of drinking water sampling around Alpena CRTC. Um, that was from 2017. That started in 2017 and still continues. So if a new well goes in, 
um, we uh, continue to take uh, new sample requests. If you have a neighbor that has not been sampled yet, um, we are still sampling in the area. Um, we also did water and sediment sampling around the base perimeter in 2021. Uh, Eagle also reviews Air National Guard reports and work plans um, to make sure everything is, is there and everything's being investigated. Um, we continue to support Air National Guard as they continue the CERCLA process uh, by collecting additional data um, to drive further investigation and fill in data gaps uh, as needed. So the last time uh, Eagle spoke to you, um, we had a different uh, drinking water standard. We were using the uh, EPA Lifetime Health Advisory, um, which was a combination of PFOA and PFOS uh, at 70 parts per trillion combined. Um, since then, um, effective in August 2020, um, we now uh, uh, compare uh, values um, for seven different PFAS types. We now have seven different um, PFAS standards in Michigan. Um, the asterisks there on PFOA, um, that's a note that only PFOA has been exceeded in drinking water well data uh, surrounding Alpena CRTC. Speaking of uh, drinking water results, these are uh, sample results from the initial Eagle sampling. Uh, DHHS has continued resampling, uh, but this is showing Eagle data only from the initial round of sampling. Um, we have one exceedance uh, of PFOA um, east of the uh, Alpena CRTC. We do know that the groundwater aquifer uh, flows from west to east uh, generally. Um, and that surface water at Alpena CRTC um, runs to the Thunder Bay River um, or on site to a sinkhole on site. Um, but uh, our one um, exceedance of PFOA is located off to the east. Um, and you see that we have a few clusters of detections. Those are shown in yellow. So we have one exceedance in red and then um, where PFOA was detected is shown in yellow. We have a lot of non-detect samples here. 102 of 127 total samples were non-detect for PFOA. When we look at total PFAS, uh, we see similar results. We again see these, these clusters of results in the same areas where we saw uh, PFOA. So we are analyzing for all of the different uh, PFAS types uh, and comparing it, comparing those different PFAS types to the, the Michigan standards that I showed earlier. Eagle also did a significant amount of uh, water and uh, sediment or soil uh, sampling around Alpena CRTC. Um, we wanted to look at um, a runoff from Alpena CRTC um, also look at how some surface water could be affected to the east and to the north. Um, the Thunder Bay River um, flows from one uh, reach, uh, flows from south to north, and the other flows from west to east. So we wanted to get background concentrations to see how much uh, Alpena CRTC and the, the AFFF use at the site could be contributing to, to surface water values here. So showing the results here, um, we had three locations that exceeded surface water criteria. Um, all of the other samples here did not uh, exceed surface water values for PFOS. And, and that the surface water value here that we're comparing to is 12 parts per trillion for PFOS. The one exceedance was already a known spot uh, where we had um, P, uh, a PFAS value beforehand from the Alpena CRTC site inspection. Uh, we wanted to verify that result. Uh, much of the uh, groundwater or the shallow um, uh, groundwater at the site flows towards a sinkhole at the center of the site. That's what this exceedance indicates. Um, it's quite high here at the center of the site. This value is over 2,000 parts per trillion PFOS. Um, and then the other two um, this uh, sample here was taken at uh, or near 
the former wastewater treatment plant at um, at the airport um, that had a concentration of uh, approximately 100 parts per trillion PFOS. So that also exceeded. Um, and then this one um, was a stormwater ditch that also exceeded. Um, that was at 25 parts per trillion PFOS. Um, so all of these exceedances, um, we expect that in the remedial investigation that Air National Guard um, look at those. Um, we expect them to look at how uh, groundwater or surface water uh, on the site uh, runs off into the sinkhole. Um, we expect them to look at the, the former wastewater treatment plant or how some of the known contamination could cause an exceedance here and how uh, PFAS could be getting into uh, stormwater at the site and also sanitary sewers um, because uh, PFAS can infiltrate uh, storm and sanitary sewers. Um, but um, downgrading of all of these uh, exceedances, um, we did not see exceedances um, downstream of those. So that is um, uh, encouraging. So what are EGLE's next steps? It's to continue su to support Air National Guard as they continue the investigation. Uh, EGLE will continue to fill in data gaps and drive additional investigation where we believe it's needed. We will continue to review Air National Guard reports and provide input for work plans in a timely manner to facilitate the, the circle of process and keep things moving along. Uh, we will coordinate efforts with Air National Guard and uh, Department of Health and Human Services, as well as other divisions within EGLE to make sure all exposure routes um, to humans, to the environment uh, get looked at. And we will continue to provide updates to the public through, you know, town halls, um, you know, local meetings and uh, through the Empire website. So with that, I will turn it over to Seisha Kalakuri, toxicologist with DHHS. Thanks, Christian. So now I'll go over the details of the private well resampling effort that the State Health Department conducted over the past couple of years. Um, next slide. So our main purpose is to be protective of public health. And since PFAS fluctuations in drinking water wells is unknown, we retested wells to understand if the levels have increased, decreased, or remained the same over time. And it also helps us assess if existing public health response actions are adequate, or if there is need for additional actions that need to be taken. And in the interim, we've offered um, certified filters in the area as needed. And so data over time from this resampling effort will help us make a final public health determination. And Eagle will use the data from groundwater monitoring wells um, to characterize the contaminated plume, for example, how deep or how wide it is. Next slide. So when it comes to evaluating drinking water test results, we look at all available numbers, such as the MCLs and the public health drinking water screening levels. And to guide our public health actions, we use the lowest of these two sets of numbers, and we are calling it the PFAS comparison value. So here we are using the MCL as a comparison value for all PFAS except PFOS, PFOS. So while the MCL for PFOS is set at 16 parts per trillion, we use a slightly lower number of eight parts per trillion, which is our public health screening level. So comparison values are not regulatory numbers like the MCLs, but we only use them um, you know, to guide our public health recommendations. Next slide. So again, comparison value is only one of the many considerations that is used to evaluate residential well results or to make the appropriate public health recommendations. And just because you have levels above the comparison value, it does not mean that it can result in health effects, but it means that further evaluation is needed. So we look at the entire package, such as the overall results in the area and how historic results at an address, you know, compared to the most current and the current results and any other available site specific information, such as what we know about the source, its strength or the extent of the contamination, the geology in the area, or even the groundwater flow direction. And if there are any hits in, you know, groundwater monitoring wells and the location of those relative to the source, et cetera. Next slide. So the State Health Department retested drinking water wells in the Alpena area starting December 2019, and we've so far completed three rounds of retesting. 
Uh, we've reached out to all homeowners that had their well initially sampled by Eagle since the start of the investigation in 2017. And we did that um, through recruitment letters, press releases, and even phone calls you know, to individual homeowners to schedule sampling appointments. And some people learned about the investigation for the very first time, either through their neighbors or the press releases. And for those who reached out to us, we've honored those first time requests as well. Um, and again, this is as long as they are within the sampling boundary. Um, and a total of 128 unique addresses were sampled till date since the beginning of the investigation. Um, we hope to do maybe one other round of retesting sometime next year, at which point we look at all the data gathered over time to make a final public health determination. Um, and to summarize the results for all the three rounds we have so far, it's a pretty low impact area with mostly no PFAS found in well water or very low level PFAS detections. And only three homes out of the 129 tested so far had leveled slightly above our comparison value for either PFOA or PFOS. Um, and the other PFAS um, that I showed comparison values for uh, did not exceed uh, those levels. And the highest total PFAS, which is the sum of all the PFAS that we were able to test for, was about 52 parts per trillion that we found during round two. Um, and another important point to note here is that we tested for 28 dif different PFAS during rounds one and two, but we tested for 39 PFAS during round three. Now, although we tested for 11 additional PFAS during round three, they were not found in people's wells. And this resampling data, you know, all, all together is pretty consistent with Eagle's initial sampling data. Next slide. So for the public health response actions, you know, based on our evaluation of the results, we could either say that your well water is okay for consumption or recommend that you use a filter um, as a precaution, since we are not sure how PFAS levels might fluctuate over time. And once we make that recommendation, we ask that you continue filter use until we come back and make a final public health determination. So the point of use filters were provided as an interim measure, as I mentioned earlier, and the recommendations were based off of a single sample that we collected at the time. And our resampling effort will you know, pave the road for the final public health determination. Um, in addition, we also provide outreach and education with respect to PFAS and drinking water. Next slide. So here are the filters we recommend and offer uh, that are certified for removal of PFOA uh, and PFOS up to 96%. Um, so you'll either see an NSF P473 certification or standard 53 on the manufacturer's label. And it is a three-stage granular activated carbon system that goes underneath your kitchen sink. So if you've been recommended a filter through our results letters, or if you already have one and need replacement cartridges, you know, you can contact District Health Department 204, um, and we'll put that info you know, in the chat in case you need it. The next slide. So besides drinking water results, we also evaluate data for fish that Eagle or DNR collects, and then we set consumption advisories accordingly. For more general statewide guidelines, you can visit you know, michigan.gov slash eatsafefish website. The next slide. So we evaluate PFAS levels in fish fillet only, along with other chemicals such as mercury and PCBs. Um, and you know, we issue fish consumption guidelines as needed, which would include a do not eat fish advisory if levels were um, unreasonably high. And walleye and northern pike, the ones that are highlighted, highlighted here to, to the bottom of the table, were the only fish analyzed for 16 different PFAS besides other suite of chemicals um, due to the concerns over possible contamination from the base. Um, and fish were collected from the impoundment at two general locations in Lake Winya. Uh, one was in the southwest portion of the impoundment near the airbase, and the second was the northeast portion of the impoundment, about a mile and a half away from the base arm. Um, now, PFOS uh, levels were detected in walleye between 1.6 parts per billion to 8 parts per billion. And in Northern Pike, the highest was about 1.7 part per, parts per billion. So in order for us to issue a do not eat advisory, the levels have to be about 300 parts per billion. So I just, I'm just letting you know, um, relatively speaking, they're very low levels um, in fish. 
Um, and which is why the driving chemical, meaning the chemical causing the Michigan serving recommendation is mercury for both walleye and northern pike. And we have serving recommendations based on the size of fish. Um, if you want to look at the guidelines for the main branch or the upper south branch for Thunder Bay River, they are available on our Eat Safe Fish website. Um, next slide. So during spring and summer 2018, um, deer samples were collected from targeted locations in proximity to PFAS contaminated surface water bodies. You can check out the details of the locations where deer were harvested in, our, in the report, the technical report that's available on the MPART website. Next slide. So 20 deer um, about age uh, one year or older, both sexes, male and female, were, have, uh, were harvest, harvested around Lake Winya, and they were tested for 16 different PFAS, same, same as you know, in the fish. Um, and here we tested you know, muscle, liver, kidney, and fat. And you know, the deer were also tested for chronic wasting disease and bovine tuberculosis prior to PFAS testing. And the results indicate no PFAS were detected in the muscle samples, uh, but the liver and kidney sa uh, samples did have um, low level detections of PFHXs, PFNA, and PFOS. Again, same as in fish, to, to uh, issue a do not eat advisory, the levels have to be about 300 parts per billion, and the highest was only about 14.3 parts per billion. So levels this low are again, not a health concern. Um, and again, since very little scientific information exists on white-tailed deer and PFAS, additional testing and modeling studies are required to understand PFAS consumption and wildlife. And, you know, we also do have an Eat Safe Wild Game website, just like the fish. So if you want more details, you can always check out that. The next slide. So this form that we are talking about is different from the AFFF form that was used at the fire training areas at the CRTC base. Um, here we are talking about foam on water bodies, which can either be naturally occurring or PFAS containing. Um, so we can tell a PFAS containing foam from a naturally occurring one uh, by its bright white color. It piles up like shaving cream and gets blown off since it's really light in weight. And it can also be a bit sticky. Whereas the naturally occurring foam is tinted, and is usually due to decomposition of aquatic plants that contain the organic compounds, uh, which when released can alter the characteristics of water and foam up. Um, again, on the MPART webpage, we do have more details about foam. So, you know, feel free to check that out. The next slide. So we noticed that, you know, foam in general does have higher amounts of PFAS compared to levels in um, in surface water. So rinse off foam if, if, if you do come in contact with it and rinsing in the lake or the river is okay. And as a good hygiene practice, stay away from any kind of foam regardless and bathe or shower after the day's outdoor activities. Um, again, like I said, water is not a concern. So enjoy recreational activities such as swimming, boating and fishing. Uh, we are more concerned about incidental swallowing of foam with high levels of PFAS. So do not allow your pets to drink foamy water either. And if, if they do come in contact with foam, then rinse your pets with fresh water um, so they don't swallow the uh, PFAS that, that might be on their fur. Um, the next slide. With that, I'll hand it off to Colonel James Rossi, Alpina CRTC Commander, excuse me, and Jim King, Alpina CRTC Restoration Program Manager. Um, and they are going to be discussing the Air National Guard response to PFAS at Alpina CRTC. Thank you. Thank you, Sasha. Can uh, can you all hear me okay? Yep, you sound good. Wonderful, thank you. So thank you to the team. Uh, I'm Colonel Jim Rossi, the CRTC commander uh, here at in Alpena since uh, August of 2020. Uh, I've got a whole team of, uh, of experts surrounding me here at the base, including our, uh, our fire chief, Chief Wolford, our base civil engineer, uh, Major Anthony Hilko, and both of our directors, our operations director, Lieutenant Colonel Dustin Budd, and our mission support director, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Dave Lazagna. Uh, appreciate, uh, appreciate you all being in attendance tonight to hear uh, this important update on PFAS and PFOA. I especially appreciate the partnership with EGLE, uh, with the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, with MPART, uh, and of course our, our partners at the Air National Guard Readiness Center. 
our our headquarters, our Air National Guard headquarters. You know, one of one of the unique things about the Air National Guard, or one of the things that sets us apart from active duty, is that we are um, we are not moved around every two, three, or four years like like our active duty counterparts are. We are stationed at a base very typically for our entire career. Uh, so we, that makes us, uh, you know proud, permanent members of the Alpena community. We live, uh, our roots, uh, our families, uh, and us are important uh, contributors, contributors of this community, and we have deep roots in the community, and we share community concerns about any PFAS and PFOA impacts. The Air National Guard's top priority is to ensure that no one is drinking water above the EPA lifetime health advisory standards of 70 parts per trillion for PFAS and PFOA, resulting from Air National Guard mission-related activities. The Air National Guard follows a process called CERCLA, C-E-R-C-L-A, and that stands for Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act. That's a law, a federal law, that was passed in the early 1980s that essentially establishes federal guidelines for how to clean up and how to address, uh, how to address any environmental concerns that might exist out there. Wherever PFOS and PFOA levels exceed that, uh, that EPA health advisory and drinking water, the Air National Guard is gonna take appropriate response action for off-base drinking water where the impacts are attributable to the Air National Guard. Next slide, please. Now there was, as part of our site, as, as, part, of our, uh, as part of the CERCLA process, as I mentioned, there are eight different steps. The step that we're in now is the third step. Uh, it, and it's called remedial investigation. Mr. King, I'm going to hand the microphone over to him in a moment, and he'll get into what a remedial investigation is intended to do. Uh, but prior to a remedial investigation, we, uh, we collectively, the team, has accomplished a site investigation. Uh, and that site investigation did not indicate complete exposure pathways from the Air National Guard PFOS and PFOA sources that we know exist on base to any areas off base where human water, uh, human drinking water receptors uh, are occurring above the EPA standard, uh, the health advisory standard. Back in 2017, uh, we, we uh, conducted a town hall meeting to, to discuss uh, the results of the site investigation, essentially give a status update of where we're at in the, in the CERCLA process. And our briefing today is really intended to do the same thing, to give an update of where we are at now uh, in that circle of process, uh, and, and of course, field any questions that might that might exist. So, with that, I'd like to uh, I'd like to hand it over to Mr. Jim King, who is the Environmental Restoration Program Manager at our headquarters at the Air National Guard Readiness Center. Uh, and and from a from a uh, kind of a perspective standpoint, the Air National Guard Readiness Center they are our um, they are our headquarters. They're also kind of the lead federal agency for addressing PFAS uh, investigations and remediation. Mr. King, over to you, sir. Thank you, Colonel Rossi. Good evening, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Yep, you sound good. Great, thank you, Christian. Uh, next slide, please. As uh, Colonel Rossi mentioned, the Air National Guard follows the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act, or CERCLA, and uh, the Air National Guard is using a three-step approach to assess uh, potential PFAS impact to drinking water and respond appropriately. Uh, steps are identify, respond, and prevent, and I will be going over these steps uh, during the next three slides. Next slide, please. So under the identify step, the Air National Guard will uh, look at uh, form a records review on, under what we call a preliminary assessment in order to identify any potential areas or that are known or suspected to have had releases of PFAS, such as fire training areas or crash sites. And uh, where the preliminary assessment provides sufficient evidence of releases warranting additional investigation, we will conduct what's called a site inspection and we will, we will uh, take groundwater, soil, um, surface water and sediment samples in order to confirm that uh, PFAS releases are above screening levels in environmental media. So once the site inspection uh, data indicates a potential complete exposure pathway 
from any uh, Air National Guard PFAS source area to a drinking water. Um, we'll expand the uh, site inspection footprint and may test off base drinking water wells. When the site inspection is complete, the Air National Guard determines uh, whether or not a remedial investigation or feasibility study is required to delineate the nature and extent of any PFAS impacts that have, in areas where we've exceeded the uh, screening levels. Next slide, please. During the uh, respond step, um, the Air National Guard will determine whether any PFAS, PFOA levels exceed the EPA lifetime health advisory, as Colonel Rossi mentioned earlier, in drinking water attributable to uh, Air National Guard operations. And uh, if that's the case, we will take uh, measures to reduce the risk, and if needed, provide alternate drinking water, like bottled water, until a permanent solution is in place. Next slide, please. Under the prevent step, the Air National Guard has been actively eliminating legacy AFFF at authorized disposal facilities. We've also been replacing our AFFF with a more environmentally responsible formula and uh, also actively retrofitting our fire vehicles with an ecologic system that prevents foam discharge during equipment testing. Next slide, please. This figure depicts our um, uh, circle process, high level view from when we identify a new site, investigate it, clean it up and possibly uh, perform long-term management. Uh, at uh, Alpena CRTC in particular, we have already conducted the preliminary assessment and site inspection, and we are currently in the remediate, remedial investigation phase. So we're well underway, and I will be ex explaining um, this remedial investigation uh, phase over the next few slides. And I also want to uh, uh, emphasize that at any point, if we determine a hazard to human health or the environment um, in the circle process, we can, we can take a response action. Next slide. So as Colonel Rossi mentioned earlier, we performed the preliminary assessment in April of 2015. We identified 10 potential release areas. Of those, five were determined uh, to be carried forward to a further evaluation in a site inspection, which was completed in March of 2018. Um, but in those five PRLs, we took uh, groundwater, soil, um, sediment, and surface water samples to confirm the release above screening levels in environmental media. And in groundwater in particular, concentrations ranged from not detect to 82,000 parts per trillion. And data did not indicate a complete exposure pathway from Air National Guard PFOS, PFOA source areas to off-base drinking water receptors at Alpena CRTC above the EPA's health advisory. Next slide. This figure depicts the five PRLs we looked at during the investigation. Um, the, the legend um, indicates diamonds for surface water samples and um, circles for groundwater samples and um, green for non-detect, yellow for detections but no, no exceedances and uh, um, orange for exceedances above the EPA's lifetime health advisory. And again, I would like to iterate that um, the National Guard's top priority is that no one is drinking water containing PFOS before or above the uh, Environmental Protection Agency's lifetime health advisory levels. Next slide. So the International Guard recently awarded um, what we call a remedial investigation. It was awarded in September of 2020 through the United States Army Corps of Engineers to ATI, CTI Joint Venture, and AECOM with an anticipated completion date of September of 2023. So this is gonna be a multi-year effort. We'll be collecting data to characterize the site conditions and determine the nature and extent of uh, PFAS impacts. 
We will also be assessing exposure pathways to potential receptors and risks to human health and the environment. We will also update the conceptual site model and conduct a human health risk assessment. Next slide, please. So the areas we will evaluate during the remedial uh, investigation um, are where PFAS was released. Um, we, we wanna confirm that release above uh, in the environment, environmental media above screening levels in areas such as fire training areas and uh, nozzle testing areas. We will be evaluating the potential migration pathways and the field work will be conducted during multiple mobilizations. We will be uh, sampling uh, soil, groundwater, sediment, and surface water. We will also be, um, if additional sampling is required, we will do that as well, depending on what the data reveal. Um, the, the International Guard, as well as the remedial investigation project team, will be working uh, closely with Eagle to evaluate the data. This is an iterative process. We're planning on four mobilizations initially, and uh, Depending on what each round of data reveal, we will make a determination on what the next um, steps will be. So again, just want to uh, iterate uh, to everyone that uh, um, at any time during the circle process, if there are hazards or risks to human health, the Air National Guard can perform a removal action. Next slide. So the first mobilization will occur in the spring. And we expect to have a final report um, for this remedial investigation uh, in the fall of 2023. Next slide, please. Of course, uh, during this process, the Air National Guard, as well as the um, remedial investigation team will be um, following all COVID um, requirements that the federal and state authorities have put in place. Uh, this this uh, slide depicts the handout that we um, pass out to folks um, that we are interacting with. Next slide, please. Also, if you have any questions about not only this effort, but any remedial activity or actions that we've taken in the past, as well as any correspondence that uh, you know, we've interacted with, um, with Eagle. Uh, you can find it on the administrative record. I placed the URL at the top of this uh, slide. This site covers um, reports and correspondence for all installations throughout the Air Force to include active Air National Guard as well as base realignment and closure bases. So in this case, you would uh, select the center radio button indicating Air National Guard, and thankfully for Alpina, the bases are listed in alphabetical order. So you would click on Alpina CRTC or Alpina County Regional, and then you would hit the search button. And that will give you a list below. You can't see the entire list, obviously, but that would give you all the um, past uh, reports and correspondence that we have in Alpina. And if for some reason you want to narrow your search, all you have to do is type in a keyword in the full document search, box up there and hit search again, and that'll narrow your search to make it more convenient for you. Uh, next slide. If you have any com uh, comments or uh, questions regarding um, Alpina CRTC in general, uh, please contact Ms. Penelope Carroll at the number you see there. If you have any technical questions regarding the RI or any other remedial activity that the International Guard has conducted in the past, uh, please feel if you get free to reach out to me as well, I've got my email and uh, phone number there. I've also included a copy of our National Guard uh, PFOS PFO website to provide more information. And I've also relisted the um, um, administrative record URL there again for your convenience. So next slide. So this concludes my portion of the presentation and um, we're ready to take any questions that you may have. Thank you. Christian? We're gonna hand it over to Sumanente. Okay. Yeah, 
Hi, everyone. My name is Sue Menenti. I'm with the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, and I work in community engagement and outreach. I also want to let you know that I'm from Alpena, so this site, um, in addition to all the other sites I have, is uh, definitely of particular interest to me. We do have instructions on how to ask a question in Zoom, and you saw these questions a little bit earlier, or saw this slide a little bit earlier. And we'll leave these instructions up in case uh, you do want to ask a question you haven't done so already. We have received some questions and I'm going to go through those and we'll have some of our presenters answer the questions uh, in the order that we receive them. So let's get going with our first question. Uh, the first one is from Gary and Gary has a question that I believe is for Sasha. Uh, it is, can PFAS PFAS cause Parkinson's disease? So the health effects slide I shared is what we have, you know, in terms of PFO or PFOS exposure and, um, and the increased risk of those health effects. So Parkinson's disease is not one of them. Um, so we can't really pinpoint saying that PFAS exposure can result in Parkinson's disease. All right, thank you, Sasha, for that. The next question is from Mike. Actually, he's got, uh, well, I guess it's one question. Uh, and I believe this is for Eagle or the Guard. Uh, the question is, contaminated groundwater is entering the sanitary sewer system on the CRTC and is having a negative impact on the city wastewater treatment plant and surface water. Will anything be done to eliminate this situation? So I can start that off. So um, our water resources division uh, is working with city of Alpena um, to get them on a monitoring plan. So far, um, they don't have an exceedance of PFOS uh, in their system. Uh, results have been variable. That's why they are continuing to monitor. Um, we are aware that uh, PFAS impacted groundwater could be getting into the sanitary sewer system at Alpena CRTC. Um, and on, in our review of the work plan, we have asked um, uh, that to be included as part of the remedial investigation to look at um, sanitary sewers, but also uh, stormwater at the site. Um, we're just getting our hands around that. Um, the initiative for the wastewater treatment plants in the state is just starting. They are just starting to sample for PFAS. Um, and, it, and it is being found in many of the, the wastewater treatment plants throughout the state. So um, it's something that Eagle um, is just starting to get their hands around. All right, thank you for that. The next question is from Marie. And Seisha, I believe this is for you. Besides testing drinking water, are citizens getting tested? And under what conditions can citizens get tested for PFAS and how would one go about getting tested? So in the Alpena CRTC area, uh, the straightforward answer to that is citizens are not getting tested for PFAS in their blood. Um, but then if you do choose to get a blood test, you know, it does tell you how much PFAS is in it, but we can't interpret what those results mean, whether it's going to result in health effects in the future, or if your existing health conditions have a correlation to PFAS in your blood. Um, so there's a lot that's unknown about it, but however, we are conducting a lot of biomonitoring and, you know, health studies um, in other parts of the state. So we are collecting that information and that's going to be representative you know, of um, populations that are near highly contaminated areas. Um, if you want more information, we do have the biomonitoring website. I can put that in the chat. I just don't remember that over the top of my head, uh, but you can find more information about those studies and you know, um, what kind of studies and what information we are collecting through those. That website, and Seisha, please do put that in the chat, is michigan.gov slash D-E-H bio. So it's michigan.gov slash D-E-H bio. Thanks, Seisha. The next question is from Phil, and Phil has two questions. Why haven't we tested livestock in the area, and is that in future plans? So considering, you know, this is a low impact area, we haven't gone that 
extent to even test livestock, but um, that would be a question for you know the Department of Agriculture and Rural Development. It's our sister agency that we work closely with uh, when it comes to testing of livestock um, or you know any of the other deer meat and stuff. So. Um, Besides that, about future plants, I can't speak to that at this moment because, like I said, a pretty low impact area, you know, we are trying to do that at some of the other areas, probably in the future, but as of now, we don't have any plans. Okay, and Phil's second question, someone said the Eagle will ultimately announce a final health determination on PFAS contamination in the area. When might that happen? And considering levels are so low, why can't that be done at this time? So that might be for me again, I assume, Sue. Um, I was the one who said, you know, we are going to be looking at the retesting or the resampling data uh, that we collected over time. And we plan to do another fourth round because it wouldn't hurt, considering, you know, the levels have been stable for the past five years since 2017, we've, we, we are seeing that the data is consistent, but we but just by looking at the data, we can make the de decision. We have to look at the overall results for the area, compare historical and current results, look at the trends, you know, the spatiotemporal trends, and, you know, do a statistics, run statistics, and then see what kind of uh, recommendations we can make. And again, when I say final public health determination, it's either saying, hey, you can go back to drinking your well water, because consistently for the past five years, your water has been doing okay, or it's below the health-based values. Or we can just say, we've offered you a filter, so keep continue using that, or, you know, and, and then we'll, we'll point you to sources in order to fix if, if we think it's a concern. If your well water is a concern, we are going to make the appropriate recommendations at that point. Hi, Sue, if I could just, my name is Bill Farrell. I'm a toxicologist with uh, DHHS. I also manage our PFAS site response operations. Um, one other additional point I wanted to make out is in terms of um, making our public health determinations, we look not only at the residential well sampling data, we also want to see and understand the investigation data that's going on to define uh, the source area, the extent of the source area, strength, and that type of thing. So there's, there's different sources of information that we look at in, in order to make our final, health, final public health determination. It's not just the drinking water well sampling data. So I just want to make that point. And Sasha, we will be testing wells again next year, 2022? Yep. We have okay. plans to test that sometime summer 2022, but that could be pushed back or, you know, uh, depending on, you know, the testing that's happening at the other sites across the state as well, but definitely, um, you know, sometime next year. Okay, thanks. Um, Judy, I uh, read your note and Judy is interested in having her water tested. So Judy, uh, I would say that someone will be contacting you within the next couple of days. Um, it could be Seisha, it could be Christiane. But um, yeah, I, I won't read your entire note, but I understand your concern and we'll have somebody contact you in the next day or two. So thank you for sending that in. All right, and a question from Ken. Does the Michigan Civil Air Patrol have any mutual aid agreements with the Michigan uh, Air National Guard concerning PFAS and CERCLA. Trying to understand the question is. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, it's Colonel Rossi here. I, I'm not aware of any uh, any mutual. I'm not aware of any mutual aid agreements between the Civil Air Patrol and the and the Air National Guard uh, regarding any PFAS and PFOA. I can tell you that our uh, we have a Civil Air Patrol unit that uh, that is a tenant of the CRTC, and they're welcome. Uh, they're welcome to come here and accomplish training uh, and the like when when they need to. But that's, uh, to my knowledge, uh, the extent of our relationship. Certainly at the installation level, I'm not sure about the state level. Though. Okay, thank you. And Ken provided his email address. He would like someone to follow up with him on that. So we'll be sure that happens. Thank you, Ken. Those are all of the questions that we've received during the presentations. Oh, we just got one more. 
Uh, how far away from the CRTC are properties being affected on M32? So I'll, I'll address that question. So, so far, um, we don't have a good handle on how much PFAS is getting into the subsurface at Alpena CRTC and how that could be affecting drinking water. Um, we have sampled within one mile of a uh, one mile radius of Alpena CRTC. Uh, and I, sh I showed those results earlier. Um, we've seen um, one exceedance of PFOA. Um, and, and outside of that, it's, it's low level detections uh, or non detect values. I can also quickly add that, you know, based on our retesting, we do have three homes that have exceeded. Um, like I said, this could be new homes that we've honored um, for testing, you know, within the sampling boundary. So it's two homes that are above the PFOA value, but very slightly above uh, the eight part per trillion. I believe the highest was only about 10.6 parts per trillion. And there was one other home that had only PFOS exceedance. Um, our cutoff value is at eight parts per trillion, but the highest was about uh, probably 14 to 17 parts per trillion. So that should be only three homes within out of 129 that were tested so far. Thanks, Sasha. There are no further questions. Ah, well, Steve, I uh, would like to thank all the agencies involved in the hard work they are doing to safeguard our community. Thank you for that, Steve. We appreciate that. Uh, and Barbara would like to know if detected, who has the responsibility to clean up for cleanup? I like what what was discussed in the, the PowerPoint. So as part of CERCLA, um, Air National Guard would be responsible for the cleanup um, at the base um, if they detect um, you know, PFAS uh, above um, the Michigan uh, cleanup values. I don't know if you want to add to that, uh, Mr. King. Yeah, thank you, Chris John. So we will be conducting our investigation uh, to de determine the nature and extent of the contamination. And um, we will be delineating to um, the EPA's lifetime health advisory of 70 parts per trillion. However, if there are changes in the, the DOD requirement uh, or EPA's requirement in the future, um, we'll, we will be standing uh, ready to move out. So, but to answer your question, um, the Air National Guard, when we find um, uh, contamination above the criteria, we will uh, clean it up. So hopefully that answers your question. All right, thank you. Just waiting a second for, see if we get another question. I'm not seeing anything. All right, I will turn this back over to Christiane. Thank you for all of your questions and comments. Okay, and before I turn it back over to Mike Gurney, who's been hosting the presentation, um, I wanted to quickly go through um, the MPART website. I wanna make sure um, everyone knows how to find this website. If you um, type in michigan.gov slash PFAS response, michigan.gov slash PFAS response, um, you can find a whole host of, of different resources on this website, including um, the investigation at Alpena CRTC. Um, you can find that by going to P, uh, uh, PFAS sites there. Um, you can also find watershed investigations. Uh, if you're interested in, in a certain body of water, um, it's, it's possible that may have been tested for, for PFAS. Um, we also have this new uh, MPART uh, PFAS information system, um, which is a very cool uh, GIS system um, that incorporates uh, so much of the data that we have collected uh, throughout the state. So um, this includes um, public water supplies, it includes our, our PFAS sites, which are shown here in with triangles. Um, so that's another way you can, you can get to the Alpena CRTC page, um, but it also has many of the um, surface water uh, samples that have been collected in the area. Um, so that's a, a very cool resource that you can check out. 
Um, like I said, Alpina CRTC, um, this page is, is updated, updated monthly, um, sometimes every other month, um, and, it, and it shows recent accomplishments. It has uh, maps, um, it has my information at the top, um, and, and, and if you can't find something on this page, um, feel free to contact me there. And with that, I will turn it back over to Mike Gurney. Thanks, Christian, uh, and thanks to all of our uh, present uh, presenters uh, here this evening and uh, everyone who uh, attended. Oh, it looks like we have one more question. Oh, yes, we have uh, Phil has his hand raised. So let me see if I can. Uh, un all right, Phil, see if you can unmute yourself and ask your question. I can unmute myself. Excellent. Can you hear me? Yep. OK, I just have one question about the numbers. I know that. Uh, the initial testing, somebody said that 102 of 127 wells. But when I look at the slide that was put up uh, on the samplings, it says that in round one, 70 wells were tested, round 286 and round 362. I don't see anything coming close to 127. So I must be missing something or um, not looking at this correctly, something. So I can clarify that. Um, so Eagle, when they initially began the investigation since 2017, they were able to um, sample about 129 unique addresses. Now, when it comes to retesting, we reached out to each of those 129 addresses, like I said, through recruitment letters to those homeowners, and we put out press releases, but those numbers on the slide Yep, that's the one, thank you. So those numbers on the slide is what is the response that we've got each round. So we've reached out to 129 the first round in December 2019, only 70 participated. We reached out again in round, uh, you know, during round two, uh, summer of 2020 and 86 participated. And again, this year, Jan and February, only 62 were able to, um, you know, confirm that they are available and, you know, that we can go out to collect a sample of their wealth. Okay. so. So the numbers on the screen right now are really the important numbers, not the number of people that were contacted. Yep. Correct? Well, yep, we do have data for the 129. It's just that I don't have the initial data shown here. Um, all I can say is it's pretty consistent with what we are finding from the retesting of wells. And again, if you notice that the 70, 86, and 62, only a subset of those homes are common for, you know, three of those rounds. It's possible that some homes might have participated just in round one and not two and three, and some homes might have participated in, you know, only a couple of rounds and not all three of them, you know? What right. And, and if I can clarify, Phil, so this initial slide that was all of the initial samples that were taken this these are the you know the we had the initial town hall and all of this uh, everyone within a mile radius um, right. was given the opportunity to be sampled eagle took 127 samples 100 102 of those were non-detect 24 were non-detect to eight parts per trillion this is talking about pfoa and eight or, or sorry one exceeded that uh, eight part per trillion um, MCL. Then DHHS um, asked all of those 127 homes um, if they wanted to be resampled. And the slide that Seisha is showing um, is are the numbers of uh, homes um, that were recruited or or uh, agreed to be resampled. So 70 that first round of resampling, 86 that second round of resampling and 62 that third round of resampling. Okay, those are all homes that were part of the initial 127. That's correct. Okay, I get that now. Thank you very much. That clarifies it for me. Thanks for the question. Great, well, great follow-up question, Phil. Um, again, I appreciate everyone for engaging with us this evening um, as a reminder. We will have the uh, recording posted uh, to the website. So check out Eagle's YouTube page over the next couple of days. Um, we'll have a, a recording with the closed captioning on that. Um, really appreciate it. And if there's any follow-up questions, uh, hopefully you got everybody's contact information. And again, that MPART website is a great way to uh, find that contact information and, and ask any follow-up questions that you might have. Uh, with that, 
Thanks. And we will talk soon.